Gayatri. Uh, and uh, it is an honor to welcome all of you all today. Uh, we kick off our uh, World Autism Awareness Day and Week celebrations uh, with a very interesting and a very special talk today. Um, uh, we at IABP have been striving to bring more and more educational programs to you. Uh, and under that endeavor, we have a first Friday CME uh, series. It is a curated series. Uh, it's an open access educational series. And it is uh, today it's been uh, supported by an unrestricted grant by Alcom Laboratories. Um, uh, it is always been our tradition to have one of our seniors from IABP founding members board or EC members to welcome everybody for this uh, uh, CME web, C web series. And today, because uh, especially keeping in mind the topic that we have, we have none other than doc Professor Dr. Smita Deshpande, ma'am, to uh, uh, share her views and give a welcoming remarks. Uh, uh, we all know Dr. Smita Deshpande, ma'am. I think uh, those of us especially who are interested in research and biological psychiatry, her name is synonymous with both those uh, fields. Um, she's recently relocated to Bangalore. So now that she's conquered North, she's going to go conquer South as well. Not that she didn't have an influence in South before, but uh, now more so. Um, and uh, um, so at this point, I welcome Dr. Smita Deshpande, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, please share uh, your views and uh, welcome all the delegates today. Thank you, Rukshida. And in you, we have a very capable and very active uh, secretary. I, may your strength increase. <laughs> So these Friday uh, talks are some of the very in interesting and uh, approachable events that uh, IABP is now organizing because we recognize more and more as time passes by that the biological basis of mental disorders and indeed even uh, many mental uh, associations of physical disorders cannot be denied. Although in our management, uh, we are still at the early phases of uh, understanding of these biological causes. Nevertheless, uh, as we all realize, science progresses in, in sometimes leaps and bounds and sometimes it crawls along. So that could happen in our understanding of the brain that we are just waiting for the next breakthrough. And I'm happy that our organization, the IABP, is organizing these talks so as to make them make the biological basis of many of our mental disorders more easily understandable and communicable to our colleagues who are more interested in the other aspects of causation and management as well. Uh, the other two issues on behalf of IBP that I would like to mention here and invite your contributions and your active participation is our new journal. Uh, Dr. Alim Siddiqui, who is also a chairperson today. Uh, hopefully, Alim, you will speak a little bit about the journals. On your behalf, I'd like to uh, invite articles from all of you on the biological basis, on the biological aspects of both uh, causation and management of uh, mental disorders. The other thing that I would like to mention is the big event, the Global uh, Conference of Biological Psychiatry, which we are planning for August, mid-August, just before the Independence Day. I hope also that you will start preparing your work and your contributions for this uh, huge Congress and make it a big success. Finally, I'd like to congratulate IABP on their choice of speaker today. I know Alka for several decades and in all those times, she has been deeply interested in autism, in other uh, disorders of children especially. And I'm so delighted that she's one person who is speaking about uh, the biological basis, neurodevelopmental basis of autism today. The last but not the least is Meena, my uh, successor at the uh, ABVM's Dr. RML Hospital Department of Psychiatry. Uh, may her strength increase and may she take the department to further heights. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for joining us today. And I hope you benefit from uh, this talk today as much as I'm sure I will do. Thank you so much. And uh, over to the chairpersons. Or over to Ruxeda to hand over to the chairpersons. Thank you so much, ma'am. I think uh, uh, the speaker everyone knows so well. Uh, 
so if we have to trust anyone, I think we have to trust Alka ma'am for it. So welcome Alka ma'am. Uh, Minam, your, your opening remarks and then... Uh, Ali, can... Ali, I thought I would like to give a little chair. Ki. <laughs> <laughs> right? Okay, uh, so uh, so uh, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Smita Deshpande, ma'am, for joining us, even though uh, she was in a hurry today, uh, but it was very sweet of her to join us and share her welcoming remarks. Um, uh, it is a pleasure to introduce today's chairs. Uh, we have with us Professor Dr. Meena Chandra, who we just heard that has uh, recently taken over from uh, Dr. Smita Deshpande, and nobody more capable of than her to fill such lofty shoe, fee, uh, shoes, isn't it? Uh, she's been a teacher for more than 15 years. Um, she has more than 40 publications. Recently, she was awarded by the, um, the Commissioner of Police of, for, uh, in Delhi for the, her work in mental health within COVID-19. And her areas of interest are cognition and dementia and uh, mobile-based uh, health interventions. Um, and she's a dear friend and a great contributor to Indian science psychiatry, uh, academics, and uh, clinical uh, field as well, because she's such a prolific, a prolific, a prolific teacher as well. Uh, Dr. Uh, Meena Chandra, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's very happy, we are very happy to have you here today. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you. Um, next, we have our very um, uh, loved and beloved uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Aleem Siddiqui. I think all of us know him because he's proved his metal, I think, to all of us. And we all of us have a lot to thank him for, because uh, especially in the last couple of years that he's been running the Thursday Musing series, which is so vastly viewed. And I think it's uh, been a beneficial benefit to all of us. Uh, he's a senior psychiatrist from Lucknow. He's a professor and head at Ira Medical, Lucknow Medical College. Uh, he's also visiting professor of psychiatry at GSVM Medical College, Kanpur. Um, and uh, he's the honorary treasurer of IPS. He's the direct council member of IPS, uh, 2018 to 2021. He's IBP editor-in-chief. And, uh, you know, we are hoping... Uh, to, uh, we are looking forward to a lot of good things from him. He's also the honorary treasurer of um, Indian Association of Private Psychiatry, UP and UK chapters. Uh, and uh, he has an honorary fellowship of IMA GCB, GCP 2021. Um, and he is those of us who kind of also know him uh, on via Facebook. We know that even uh, yesterday and today, he, uh, along with the IMA uh, Indian Medical Association of Lucknow, where he's the vice president, he's been doing a lot of work on behalf of all of our medical uh, colleagues and uh, more power to him. Uh, welcome, Dr. Uh, Aleem Siddiqui, and I hand over the session to both Madam and you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you so much. My pleasure being here. I think I think we can start the session now. Yes, I think. Uh, Thank you. Do we have introduction of Alka, ma'am? Um, um, uh, we don't have. We don't generally keep slides, Aleem. So you can go ahead and tarif ki pul bandho tum. No. <laughs> Actually, not needed. Actually, this this person ko tarif ki zarur nahi. That is Alka, ma'am. Ma'am, please start the session. We all know you so well. We all trust you. And please go ahead, ma'am. Main kuch bol do Alka. Alim nahi bolna cha raha hai na. So uh, thank you so much, Alka. I am indeed blessed that I have friends and colleagues who are so learned and whom I can just call upon and send a text message and they will immediately agree for doing these wonderful sessions. And when it was told that it was you talking about autism, of course, there was nobody else that we could think about. I don't think there's any conference uh, nationally, uh, internationally that we hold or we conduct that you don't have a very active role to play in. So all of us are very lucky to have you today and we really look forward to learning a lot from from you. So uh, I know, uh, you know, I know you for a long period of time before either one of us were a psychiatrist. So it's also a personal pleasure to be here today. And of course, I bragged about it in our friend circle that oh, I'm organizing and Alka is talking. So it's it's a double pleasure for, for all of us, uh, for me today, especially. Thank you so much for accepting. Thank you, Rukshida. All those thank yous were really not necessary between friends, as you said. It's a pleasure to be here. I thank the entire organizing committee of IABP, President, 
Vice President, and of course, you, Secretary. Thank you, Smita, ma'am. Thank you, Prasad Rao, sir. And our very able chairpersons, I'm not sure that I deserve all that, but I will try to do my best today. I apologize for the slight delay we had. The, uh, somehow, technology and me, you know, we have this autistic relationship. So it happens. Anyways, so um, on the eve of World Autism Day, which is something very precious to me and has been for many years, because for those of you who don't know, we run a small center at Nair Hospital and we have a much bigger center for certifying children with neurodevelopmental disorders, particularly autism, one of probably the largest in India, definitely in Western India. And um, to be here today and speaking to you about understanding the spectrum from a neurodevelopmental lens is something which is a challenge and also a pleasure. So thank you for having me here. Let's take a quick, next slide, please. Uh, I would request all of you who are logged in with us to kindly send your answers in the chat box so it becomes much easier for us to kind of run this session without interacting uh, by putting your videos and your this thing on. So what are the cardinal features, next slide please, of autism and what are the types of autism that you know? Please answer in the chat box so we can move along actually. Or if um, there's a Facebook interface, then possibly you can answer over there. So then Rukshida can relay the answers over here. What are the cardinal features of autism that you know of? And what are the types of autism? Anyone? Yes, I see somebody. I don't know what... Not uh, Lack of social reciprocity, poor eye contact, stereotypical behavior, communication difficulties. Yes. Anybody? The types of autism? Are there different types of autism that you're aware of? I don't know. Someone has written RRS, BIA, which I cannot decipher. I'm bad with the Asperger's. Yes. Anything else? So what has happened is, thank you. High functioning, very good. So what has happened is that, next slide please. Um, yes. So DSM-4 to DSM-5 saw a cardinal shift as far as the actual core features of autism were concerned. Earlier we had different types and we used to classify them as Asperger's, Childhood Disintegrative Disorder, RETS, NOS type and there were multiple domains. However, now the core domain from three have been reduced to basically restricted interests and repetitive behaviors or social and communication deficits. And why is this? We are going to try and understand from a developmental or sometimes I would like to think a reverse developmental perspective through a series of cases. Next, please. So We'll go to these case files to see why exactly we decided to change from autism and multiple types of autism to autism spectrum disorders. Yes, next slide, please. So case one, next, next, is Akash, who was diagnosed as early onset schizophrenia at the age of 18. He was started on medication. He was referred to us for a disability certificate. He was on olanzapine and stated that his head didn't feel quite right with it. On detailed interview, we found that he'd always been aloof and made little eye contact. At school, he had no friends. His communication was minimal and very need-oriented communication. His parents tried to compel him to take up science when he wanted to do commerce. So he got very agitated. This was in class 12. He was at that time taken to a psychiatrist and he told the psychiatrist that he often feels people are talking about him and that he couldn't sleep very well and he was therefore put on olanzapine. Subsequently, he did commerce, took up a job in an accountant's firm and was quite happy. He was due for a promotion but didn't want to change his profile. Both his boss and parents were rather upset because of the same and so they referred to us for a disability certificate thinking it will benefit him because he will get his due raise without changing his profile. 
what do you think has happened to akash what do you think the issue here is really first of all are we right with the diagnosis of early onset schizophrenia if akash came to you what do you think you would like to do or how would you like to approach it in the chat box please misdiagnosis someone says so what do you think jitin if it's misdiagnosis what do you think it is revised diagnosis to what we need a detailed history yes so this is what you have right now preliminarily what would you like to think of or what would you like to do not schizophrenia okay anybody else detailed developmental history okay so that's true we need to go into more details but we have given you a little brief on the fact that he has always been a little bit on the spectrum can i have the next slide please so you see when we talk about early onset schizophrenia yeah arman says it is asd so it has to be asd because we are talking about asd today yes genius i accept agreed so we have autism spectrum and early onset schizophrenia and you look at the deficits sometimes it becomes very very difficult to tease out the deficits in the two because both of them have a core of problems with social and occupational functioning perceptual problems thought disorder in a background of genetics neurodevelopment and neuroinflammation next please so when there are multiple studies which have studied asperger syndrome and schizotypal personality disorder as we call it the relationship between the two right over a 15 year period and various periods that different researchers have studied have found that there is a lot of overlap so whether early onset schizophrenia or whether if i may say autism which stretches on as far as the deficits are concerned have a commonality and they've always have a com had a commonality is the thing that we have to really look out for so when we get adolescents who are referred to us because they have certain types of behavior at a particular developmental period when the child was provoked he had some symptoms which seemed like psychosis the age seemed right he always was on the spectrum and therefore he was given an antipsychotic but which he said it didn't really help him so what we did was we knocked it off and we took the detailed history like you all said we also did a detailed evaluation because we have a multidisciplinary team we are fortunate enough to have and we worked on and dug up whether there were attachment issues eating disorders sometimes you would have females who present differently whether there were gender identity issues and whether he evolved into a different adult presentation these are the things that we have to look for along the developmental trajectory when we are looking at a case where we are not sure whether it is early onset schizophrenia or whether we are talking about autism next slide please so like all of you said it's very difficult for us to make this diagnosis it's difficult to intervene and at times it becomes difficult because of the proneness to adverse effects so sometimes actually giving a drug free period and observing the person at times even in patient is required if you really want to come to the nitty gritty about what symptomatology you're dealing with next please this was a paper shared by dr shobhit garg today and i'm glad that he did because this shows particularly in adolescent in the adolescent brain when you have early onset psychosis which you can see in the right side if um, uh, the organizers can just help me with a pointer yes so eop you see the default mode network and you see the connections in the anterior cingulate so both the left side is the asd and the right side is early onset psychosis both of them as far as the default mode network are underconnected but in psychosis it's further underconnected as compared to um autism 
And these are the things that we are trying to study now to actually see if we can pick this up early enough to alter that developmental trajectory by intervention. So studies like this, where we are actually doing fMRI studies and we're doing SPECT studies to see the functionality at an early age, particularly with high-risk cohorts, to understand what is the future is what is coming up. Next, please. And possibly this is the reason why what helps is a drug like aripiprazole, which helps in both the conditions. Because here, if you see, this is not just a dopamine blocking agent. It is called as a dopamine stabilization agent. And that's the problem in neurodevelopmental disorders. So now we're going back into thinking that even schizophrenia, particularly early onset, is actually a neurodevelopmental disorder. So our target is not the D2 receptor. Our target is the nuclear target, if you may just point that out. And that is where there is so much of evidence to show that aripiprazole is doing a good job. And if we have to choose something, that is what we would want to choose in this sort of a case. I'm not going to go into management today much, but this I thought was important to really indicate to see how we can help if we need to help. Thank you. Please go to the next slide. So our second case for today is Mr. Bartley Boy, who was a 49-year-old man who approached us as his son was advised to undergo autism evaluation by his school. During the process, he realized that he also had similar symptoms and he should get tested. He further revealed having a strange relationship with his wife, who said he was emotionally distant. She stated that he was very good at his work, but he was a loner. Further, he was quite a miser, and every penny spent in the house had to be accounted for. He stated that he loved his wife and children, but rarely felt the need to express the same. He was a workaholic and didn't ever feel the need to socialize or spend time in frivolous things. What do you think is wrong with Mr. Butley Boy? Is there something wrong with him, first of all? Does he need an evaluation? And if so, what do you think has happened to him? Chat box, please. Please answer in the chat box. Broad autism phenotype, Swati, very good, yes. As concerns around social responses, Vilona, can you elaborate more? If we want to give him a clinical diagnosis, would you want to? Difficulty in emotional expression, OCPD traits, very good, Smita, yes. MSC would be critical, yes, Sarman. He needs evaluation for autism. And Smita, can I come back to you? Oh, uh, sorry, Vilona. What would you think concerns around appropriate social responses and rigidity? Okay, someone has said schizotypal personality. Anybody else? Next slide, please. Next slide, please. So, this is some path-breaking work which has actually taken place in progeny of um, individuals who have traits which are along the spectrum and no doubt they manifested with autism. So when they went backwards and they checked for the parents, what did they find? They found that there are three core features which one has to look at when you are treading families in the developmental trajectory. And interestingly, now this is not yet completely evidenced, but there's interesting work going on on it. Interestingly, what we find is the expression of that vulnerability is actually getting magnified. What do I mean by that? So you have the three core features which we look for in families. One is whether you have an autistic personality dimension, like Swati mentioned, it's called a broad autism phenotype. So we have put all these children in the spectrum, but the spectrum are the people who come to us clinically and we diagnose them. Now, there is a broader phenotype where you just have traits. Very often in your clinics, you feel that this child possibly has autism. Clinically, you're feeling that there are traits there. However, when you apply all this, you'll do the INCLEAN, you'll do the ISA, which 
Smita Deshpande, madam, has so beautifully designed with her group and is really a boon to India as far as our diagnosis and accuracy is concerned. We do all of that and we realize the scores are not matching. What's going on here? So in the family, you have that broader phenotype. Second is you have the neuropathological burden. So there is a genetic loading, which sometimes we don't get how much ever we dig, which is why it becomes so important to keep going into that family history again and again and again. And I'll come back to that a little later. And then, of course, the cognitive capacity of the individual, which, at, which often manifests as intellectual impairment, partly because there's actually a decline in the cognitive capacity in subsequent generation, and partly because our tests do not pick up abilities in these children, they actually pick up the disability because we are geared more towards that as a society. So today, the reverse genetics, where we are actually finding index cases are coming to us, and then we are going backwards and studying in the families what is there? Where, where was the phenotype? What were the changes there? And can we do anything as far as the genetic testing is concerned is important. So to keep in mind when you're assessing the family, these three things to really look at the broader autistic phenotype, the neuropathological burden, and the cognitive capacity of the family in general when you go back into that genogram. Next slide, please. So our next case for the day is Subhash, who was five years old, and he was actually brought to our pediatrics department because he was unable to gain weight. He had been diagnosed with ASD at the age of two years. Since then, his mother had diligently initiated therapies and a structured education plan for him just as advice. Unfortunately, he was an extremely fussy eater. Initially, he would have only mashed food with no spices or salt at all. Subsequently, he wanted hard foods like bhakari, rotla, etc. At present, he wouldn't touch fruits, he would not eat vegetables, he would not eat anything non-veg. There were days when he would survive only on water or lemon juice. This phase lasted for 15 to 20 days. And then he would be good for about 8 to 10 days. He would eat absolutely everything. He loved ice cream in that 8 to 10 days. Mother was at her wit's end and she didn't know what to do. Do you have any thoughts about what is going on with Subhash and what we can really do? Chat box, please. Getting more and more difficult? Not really. I think you guys know this. Yes. Very good. Leaky gut syndrome. What do you mean by that? Gut bacteria affected. Yes. What do you mean by that? I'm very impressed. Ajaz and Mansi. But please, can you just a little bit tell me a little more? What does that mean? Okay, it's a digestive condition that affects the lining. Mansi says the gut flora is linked to worsening of the sympathetic nervous system. I think that's what she means to say. It allows bacteria and other toxins to pass to the bloodstream. Okay, let's look at it. Next slide, please. So when you look at clinical models okay, of healthy versus disordered individuals and their gut. What we find is that there is a lot of influence of the food that we are taking, plus not only the quantity, the quality of the kind of food, and to some extent the effect of antibiotics, which is why that whole lobby is working so hard to see that we don't misuse antibiotics. Right? What is more fascinating is that when we give the right type of pre and probiotics, we can actually change the gut flora. And why is that important? Let's go to the next slide, please. So if you look over here, this leaky gut or the dysbiotic bacteria that they are talking about starts to multiply more than the common cells, right? 
and that causes a lot of um, an outflow of agents which increase the oxidative stress in the gut. So we all have been talking about neuroinflammation and oxidative stress in our brains. We at times forget that there is actually, if I may say so very loosely, a brain in the gut. Right? And it's a very, very important part of neurodevelopment. Now, whether the brain, that is the gut brain, develops, therefore it becomes leaky or vice versa. Where is the vulnerability first is something we are really still, still investing and moving on. The important part is all those red dysbiotic bacteria that you see, if we don't treat it appropriately or if it doesn't prove upon itself, the stomatology actually worsens. So we find that there is a correlation, is a linkage between times of so-called stress. Stress this is nothing but have a dip in your immunity or your immune response. Your immune we would find the dysbiotic bacteria going up and the symptoms will worsen, which is why you get so much of waxing and waning at times when there is something child or development virtual adolescence. So, particularly those who have vulnerability to feeding problems or there is a of increased mealtime behavior, meal times are very long. These are the individuals who we would benefit from giving probiotics. And I would not think that we would need to really rely too much on external probiotics, although there are a lot of people who think that they are useful and helpful, but I don't think we have that. It is important to find out of elimination what suits the child themselves and what are the things which help with the behavior. So this particular child that we had in uh, the example that we showed during the 15 to 20 days of the month, what we started doing is we started fortifying that juice with nutrients and the days that he was eating appropriately, we would give him a high calorie diet along with a high protein diet to make up for those 15 days. And over a period of, I think it was four to five years that slowly reversed. So the eight to 10 good eating days became 15 to 20 good eating days. And then we had about five to seven bad days. And of course, now he's an adult and he's managed to have only two to three bad days in a month through a process of very difficult for the parent, but very hard work. And she actually brought it to understanding what was his appropriate um, gut friendly diet, which improved the pro and the prebiotics. Next slide, please. So the next case is about Anjali, who's Aryan's mom. And Aryan was diagnosed with ASD at the age of four years. She's done everything possible to help him cope with his autism. She and her husband, both doctors, had decided not to have any more children because they knew the percentage of transmission was pretty high. And then with a sibling, you could have chances. Does anyone know what are the chances of having a sibling with autism if one child is affected with autism? Any guesses in the chat box, please? Anybody? What is the percentage chance of having the second child suffering from autism? 10%, okay. 25%, okay. 20 to 25%, 20 to 50%, sorry, 30%. All right. All right, all right. So up to 20%, which is very high because that's like one in five chances you may get it. In terms of transmission, that's pretty, pretty high. Up to 20%, the second child may have, according to some studies, but there's a huge range over there, more and more veering towards that 20%. So what happened with Anjali is that she discovered last month that she had conceived. It was, of course, totally unplanned. She doesn't want to undergo an MTP and thinks that this is an act of God. But she wants to know if the younger one has autism. How soon can I diagnose it so that I can intervene early and help? 
is there any way we can help her do any of you know the earliest way to diagnose autism are there any markers are there any tests that we do besides the screening yes genetic counseling oh no i'm now we've gone beyond that and we are asking how do we help anjali if the second one also turns out to have autism how do we diagnose early how early can we diagnose autism number 1 and how do we diagnose excellent visual tracking in infants someone has written yes my philly anybody else okay so we'll go to the next slide and some of you who may have attended this with me uh would have seen this and i really like showing this because i think there is hope here for us when we talk to parents who come in as early as megha says that as early as 12 months and possibly even before now if i can have the organizers just help me with a series of the right side if you can see do you see where the eye contact is yes yes so screen down that and you see the eyes are tracking near the eyes and look at the left side see the red mark and you see that it's totally off it is on the face but it's off and sometimes not even on the face next please so this is path breaking research which is yet going on and between 2 to 6 months they were able to find high risk not otherwise high risk babies who went on to develop autism spectrum disorder actually started out with typical eye gaze patterns however steadily their eye contact went on decreasing next slide please they actually had a good cohort and they took their siblings and they found in both the groups the 13 infants who were diagnosed later actually started reducing the eye contact and it was completely disabled by the age of 3 now don't you that is extremely fascinating to me because if at two months i started off similar to a neurotypical child and then i have lost it along the way can i do something to get to prevent that decay or degeneration that's the question i think i was here to give you a lot of pearls but i'm going to leave you with a lot of questions and a lot of things to think about and possibly research next slide please so a very quick question at this point is autism more in males or females chat box please males my philly yes everybody males 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 good 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 all right So is there any way to tell the difference early on Supposing I have a male child and a female child and both are high risk is there any way I would be able to tell the difference Interestingly yes let's go to the next slide So again the same not the same group but a similar group working on circuits in the limbic lobe have found that in neurotypical children you have circuits which get coordinated if you can point that out please whereas if you look at the limbic circuit in asd children there is a decoupling that is which means that the sense the information that is going to me and the processing of particularly emotive information is not happening the way it should be and when you look at boys since we said males are more social perception in those who are neurotypically developing to those has therefore as a domain with involvement of limbic circuitry is something we are looking at from a neurodevelopmental perspective can we take it up early can we see and understand the social cues and cognition which includes visual tracking which includes relationship with the caregiver and particularly in high risk boys and see if we can intervene at that age or at least red flag them and say that okay this is one child i'm going to call more frequently for follow ups so that in case i find that there is something that's going to happen 
I will intervene because intervention is not going to harm any child, particularly if you have a therapy, which is going to be your basis of intervention. Next slide, please. So very exciting in the future. We have, of course, sleep and sleep patterns, language, visual tracking, heart rate functioning, and then tissue structure, which starts right across the spectrums in ASD as well as schizophrenia. And we're going to be looking at a lot of work coming out over here to see if we can catch them very early and we can intervene early. Right now, the work is more so in high-risk cohorts, but I'm assuming that that's going to be control-based studies with neurotypical children so that we understand even more so what the difference is. Next, please. Yeah. So Nidhi, 26 years old, had always suffered from PCOS and thereby irregular menses. She had been trying to conceive for the past three years but had no luck. Nidhi worked in the HR department for an MNC and had often she had to work at night because her clients were in the US and UK. She did catch up on her sleep but often slept at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. A lot of her work was live online and hence she used a lot of the screen. She hardly got any time to exercise because she had to help her mother-in-law with the household cause. Now what happened was Nidhi conceived during COVID and she was terribly worried about how COVID would affect her baby if she, if she got it or if the baby got it. She went through an uneventful pregnancy and delivery but came to the hospital. This was right in the beginning as the baby was really not talking much at 15 months of age like not even much cooing or babbling sound what do you think about the baby what do you think we should be doing why do you think that maybe the speech is having a lag does Nidhi need to worry are there any risk factors your thoughts on the baby please in the chat box What should we, do, we be doing for this baby? Detailed evaluation, yes. Not related to COVID. Okay, very good. All right. Detailed evaluation, yes. Most definitely we need a detailed evaluation. But apart from that, more social stimulation, yes. Arman, good. A hearing test, excellent. Close follow-up, yes. But close follow-up, um, Ambu Pandey, for what exactly? What are you thinking along lines of? provide adequate stimulation. Are there any risk factors that you can see in this? Is there anything that you would be concerned about or worried about if you get a profile like this? Maternal stress can contribute. Can you please um, elaborate, Swati? Anxiety, yes, Prajakta. Vilona PCOS, that's right. Okay, elevated cortisol. What is elevated cortisol? I mean, Perfect, but where did that elevated cortisol come from? Right, okay, maternal stress during pregnancy. Okay, excellent. I think we'll go to the next slide for paucity of time. So you see, we harp a lot on the conditions where the mother conceived and how she was during her antenatal and the whole perinatal period, including the delivery. Constantly, I'm telling most of my fellows that please ask repeatedly again and again and again. And more so now we are realizing this whole exposome, right, which is the intermingling of the individual with the ecosystem. So PCOS is a inflammatory condition, which can cause neuroinflammation in the fetus itself. Anything where your antibody titers are high, the very fact that the mother had COVID and had COVID anxiety, a lot of moms had COVID anxiety, particularly in the first wave. She was from the first wave. So that itself can contribute. And what is not very well evidenced, but we are moving towards there is the rise of neurodevelopmental trajectory or disorders in general is largely linked with what we are doing as far as 
protection of maternal health is concerned, which is not really great compared to what it was earlier. Microplastics are being found in our bloodstream. We are yet to understand how that impacts future generations. We have a lot of toxins which are released from food and food products. And we have a changing gut microbiota of the mother. So we don't know really what kind of a not only intrauterine environment we are providing, but what intrauterine nutrients we are providing. And are we actually giving a milieu more for inflammation rather than not? Next slide, please. So melatonin is a very important hormone, as we all know, which is natural. And to, in today's day and age, what is happening is with the advent of this and most of us sleeping a little late into the night, there is a down regulation of that melatonin. And what happens? Next, please. With that is there's a disruption of the circadian rhythm problem with the synaptic plasticity and increased chances of having protein dysregulation or synthetic dysregulation, which could lead to a whole plethora of neurodevelopmental problems. There is actually work which has shown, next slide please, that giving melatonin to mothers during pregnancy and ensuring that just the sleep part of it is taken care of has actually led to better neural development. This evidence level is not very high, but it's something which we have seen throughout the pandemic that the people who took melatonin and were managed to get good sleep are the ones who actually had a better overall outcome in terms of immunity and anxiety. And I think this is something we have to keep in mind when we are asking mothers about their stress levels because sleep is so important as a single factor towards not only maternal well-being but also fetal well-being. Next. And of course, the bonding and oxytocin, the maternal support system. The reason I put oxytocin here is because oxytocin also has um, a lot of uh, research base as far as autism is concerned per se. But what becomes important is it as a support system in the maternal well-being. So we need to see that she has an environment which is conducive towards contentment and satisfaction. Next, please. So if you look at this whole trajectory, which looks a little daunting, this slide. But if you look at it, here we have at the conception, what are the risk factors could be age, previous history of problematic pregnancies, and anything else which is causing inflammation. When you come to mid-gestation, we know that infections could affect the growing fetus, right? And look at the fetal parameters at that time. That is when your microglia are growing, the immune colonization occurs, neuronal migration occurs. And then finally, you have late gestation, where, uh, can you please use the pointer while I'm talking about it, thank you, where maternal, paternal age, the brain inflammation, these things matter at that point in time. And this is where your apoptosis occur. That means the neurons which are not required are going away. So, at birth and early childhood then, whether the maturation and the synaptic pruning takes place and that's where you manifest. Now, if you don't manifest and you go ahead and you become someone like our Mr. Bartley boy, where in pre-adolescence, I am not manifesting as clinical autism. I can function well. What do I need? I need to get good marks in this country. I need to earn re decently well. And I need to probably get married and have a family. Then you think I'm successful. Am I someone who is psychologically healthy? Whoever asked me, right? So this individual is the one who is probably carrying that lineage of risk ahead.
and this is what is happening when we are not going ahead and taking care of the perinatal health which becomes so important next please So which brings us to the next case of Sunita, who's a three-year-old girl who was brought to the clinic by her parents. And they state that she was absolutely fine till the age of two years and two months when she had a severe respiratory illness and took some time to recover. However, after that, it was almost like she started going backwards. She lost her speech, then her communication, eye contact, and now she has repetitive movements and behavior too. Your thoughts on what happened to Sunita in the chat box, please. Red syndrome, yes, okay. What else? Anybody else? Everyone says childhood disintegrative disorder. Next slide, please. Would you call this as syndromic autism or would you call it pandas? Okay, so very good. Rig would you call it as regression or would you call it as syndromic autism? Do you know what syndromic autism is? In the chat box, please. Regression. Okay. Anybody else? Does anyone know what syndromic autism is? Okay, let's go to the next slide. So regression is a very fascinating... <laughs> it's not described in ICD-10. No, it isn't. That's, I have to tell you a little bit something. No, that's why I'm here today. Okay, so basically the developmental trajectory when you see in ASD and the severity of ASD versus the controls, you have multiple things which are occurring which could co-occur or they may occur in isolation we are yet not able to identify but they to some extent are related to the possible severity and the coexistence of autism with other neurodevelopmental disorders so when we talk about regression we really don't have an answer today as to why it happens to so many children. Are these children actually vulnerable? Because when you look at them and then you go again retrospectively and study, there are some signs, you know, the neurological soft sign, the red flags which are there, which we are not so tuned into myths uh, to pick up because they are such fine signs. And when we talk of syndromic autism, syndromic autism is when you have autism existing with other neurodevelopmental disorders, most commonly epilepsy, very often with intellectual disability where you're tearing your hair out to try and differentiate between the two, but you really can't very often. So there is aberrant proliferation of the neurons. There is problem with the spontaneous activity at times firing spontaneously, which is where the epilepsy comes. And of course, problems with synapses and synaptic pruning. Let's go to the next slide, please. So when you try and find out exactly where the problem lies you realize that in the syndrome or in the regression there are multiple factors that you have to see and how much how much can you really delve into it so there are seizures there may be anxiety agitation there's language impairment there may be reading writing problems there will be an altered immune system and all this comes together grafted with the core autism features or the autistic features could be part and parcel of the whole thing. You have self-mutilatory behavior. You have extremes where the individual cannot even manage ADLs. And all this comes together. Well, then you're wondering, is it because females or rats? You're wondering, is it pandas? You're wondering if it's childhood disintegrative? And what do I do with it? Next, please. So this is something where we really need to give a little bit more of our focus and get tuned to kind of asking this repeated history when we have a child who has come along the developmental spectrum. If you look at the two ends, okay, these are the things which are obvious to us, dysmorphic features and repeated abortions, right? This we often ask for and we often try and explore 
why this has happened. And in the middle, when you have a consanguineous marriage, yes, you will all think that there's something that can go wrong. Therefore, we should ask about it. What we don't really check for is the X-linked pattern of inheritance, which may be because per se there is a problem with the X-linkage or it could be an ovarian failure. Then girls, particularly with ID, do we need to rule out any other thing besides rets in them? Are we looking at any other, not only phenotypes, but genotypic lineages that we have to look for? And today where we are at is almost everywhere we advise exome sequencing or whole genome sequencing and look at that arrow. We really have nothing to offer with that because we don't know where we are headed. The genes are so variant and multiple, like a polygenic thing. So we really don't know how we are going to reach there and where we are going to reach, but we hope to come to that at some point. Next, please. So when we talk about maternal factors affecting ASD and ASD trajectories, the fact that we have to look at is maternal factors, infant and um, sibling factors, and what are the things that we can improve upon as far as the maternal well-being biologically is concerned? So are we looking towards antibodies towards the folate receptor? Are we looking towards biomarkers for like, you know, autoglandins in the endometrium? Similarly, are we looking towards ASD biomarkers during development. So these are the things that we are trying to tease out in order to reduce this overlap and this phenotypical presentation, which is so broad and sometimes so confusing, particularly in those who have had a normal development and then we have we, what we call as regression with an outdated term now. Next, please. And the individual genomics, epigenomics, and transcriptomics grafted on the environmental and the maternal risk factors is what is causing so much of an increase. We are seeing today that the numbers are just going higher and higher and higher, which is why we really need to focus on having a public health policy, which may be beyond the purview of what we are discussing today, but many of you are in positions where you can make a difference. And therefore, I think it becomes important for us to understand that the ecosystem is clearly linked to disservice that we are causing to our children because we are not realizing it. And we really need to focus a little bit on that. Next, please. So here, when you look at the brain trajectory, can I have that pointer, please? So you see the total surface area, volume, and the CSF volume as well when it's growing. And look at the behavior as far as ASD is concerned, OK? Where do you get emergence of the symptoms? At around 24 months. It's already too late. We need to pick it up in the perinatal period. We need to understand when there is our autism prodrome. There's a motor delay, atypical visual sequencing and aberrant responses very early on in life because I think when that intervention occurs over there we can actually change the life of a child to a large extent not completely it's not going to go away but at least we can help where their social functioning and independent functioning is concerned next please so what do we have in the future well complicated but interesting we do have something that is coming up. Today, what we have, next please, is actually what I, I think this has beautifully depicted is a one-size-fits-all autism. We did service from a social standpoint by putting it into autism spectrum disorders. But in terms of individuals, we have a long way to go because we need to explore what our the clinical states, what is the behaviors, the exposomes, the metabolomes, and the genomics. And that's when we would get stratified autism. Once we are able to stratify broad categories, then we can go to what is precise autism and work towards it. So the whole, the whole way through that we have seen today was backwards, actually, where you had a... You started off with an adolescence who was referred for 
schizophrenia to a father and then backwards to understanding the importance of perinatal and maternal health because in autism when you work more and more you realize it you know, less and less yes but the earlier that we pick up things and the more that we sort of work towards a a conducive uterine environment as far as possible see we cannot eliminate the genes and the gene pool that is there but if we can try and help reduce the adverse outcomes it really helps so next please to very quickly go through what we have done today is when we look at it from a neurodevelopmental lens next please we have the genetic alterations including the family history which becomes so very important a leaky gut or neuroinflammation and of course neuroanatomical changes which we saw in both boys and girls we have alterations in the transmission as well as the maternal immune system and factors which we spend a little more time on including transmission and family history to try and understand why this entity is really increasing in the world more so in males and females like all of you rightly said and then when they come to us they come with the symptoms which are problems with social communication and behavior repetitive behaviors restricted and stereotypical movements but when you look beyond that and before that and much further beyond earlier i would say than that you realize that we are dealing with something which is much bigger the lens has to be much wider and it has to capture much more so i hope that wasn't too complicated and it's thrown up a lot more questions for you to try and research and understand about autism and early autism and intervention thank you next please that's just the next slide please yeah that's the thing you have to thank the creators of slides also nowadays so we run a small center for the past 12 13 years at nayar hospital and um, we try to do our best of course we don't have as much funding as we'd like to have for this kind of research but i'm hoping that together maybe we can do something we'll be happy to take questions and i'd like to hand back to the chairs now an excellent presentation dr alka a very lucid and you have touched on all the major possible biological pathways which are being explored from uh, neuroimaging to uh, microbiota to inflammatory biomarkers uh, genomics so uh, and uh, through all the case studies each of those pathways uh, can now be shown to be clinically relevant sometimes in clinical practice young psychiatrists do not realize that okay one case of autism is just like another case but uh, you brought in some uh, examples of adult uh, uh, asd spectrum uh, and brought in everything from uh, maternal stress sleep deprivation so a lot of those factors also are important when we do our clinical evaluation i uh, would ask dr alim to give his remarks and then we'll open the house for questions Thank you so much, Dr. Gautam Sahab, for joining. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. I think we are wiser after this one hour, so we learned a lot. I think, rightly said, uh, more questions than answers we have. So uh, I think we we can open now for the question answer session. Any comments from the audience? The chair wants to allow audio or video questions. That's entirely up to you. Yes, we would love to have questions. You can either um, type in the chat box or you can raise your hand. So we can curate the questions in case there are similar questions. While we are waiting for questions, uh, let me. uh begin by asking dr alka what about dti what is the indian research using dti we have found it to be a very fascinating tool for uh you know labeling autism as a disconnectivity syndrome so uh, any uh, research at your end or in the south there is uh, no 
in the south there is research nimhans is trying to do some work the issue is that we have a lot of problems getting um, ethics committee clearance for that you see uh, we need to do the scans under anesthesia and that's where we find world over it's not only yes. india but world over we are finding a lot of uh, problem getting that kind of research. so we have managed to do a study in adhd using fmri where we didn't actually have to use anesthesia and we managed with sedation but with great difficulty with great difficulty so although i think there are researchers who want to work in this area and would be very interesting because it's you know connectivity is one thing but actually we're talking about information processing the whole issue is about how the neurons talk to each other and information processing and sensory processing so these two things coming together so i would love to do it but like i told you research and funding in this area is something which is not picked up as much in india as it has abroad so um yeah yeah i think there are some questions in the there are some questions in the chat box uh, any any clues to diagnose it antenatally autism no only thing is you have to look at high risk cohorts and you have to see so we are looking at those biomarkers which are going to work towards you know the um, the levels of um, some of the genes as well as you could look at the melatonin the fetal cortisol and see if these things are working but at present we don't have anything really which is going to pick up and say that okay this child is going to be like how you have with downs you don't have that yet there is a question from dr ejaz about sunita's case how to differentiate between syndromic autism and childhood disintegration disorder so ejaz the thing is that we don't actually use the word childhood disintegrative disorder anymore it is considered to be redundant because simply because honestly you can't really differentiate between these things we are splitting hairs there are times when we have children who look like they have global developmental delay with autism and both entities are very prominent and we are just trying to split hairs because we as a society want that child to possibly go in for a type of therapy or b type of therapy okay so what i would suggest is let's forget about what we want to label the child the most important thing is to look at what symptoms you want to target and how you want to target that symptoms those symptoms or that particular symptom phenotype so what are we going to do for the child so in sunita's case her deterioration was very rapid okay and she actually developed seizures and then she she didn't have a very um, long life also after that so we had to follow her up we gave her symptomatic relief treatment and we just intervene in the form of whatever basic occupational therapy or physiotherapy to to prevent further motor deterioration too so that at least she could take care of whatever she could and sometimes you get these children who have these neurodevelopmental trajectories which are very acute and severe and i wonder i wonder myself whether these are the types who come under the umbrella of the acute encephalitis or encephalomyelitis syndromes which we don't have you know we don't have a label for it yet and we don't have a way to pick them up right so like i told you there are more questions today than answers absolutely and the next question is from arman pande anxiety pathways in brain and their role in asd uh, could that help us diagnose early if you if you use parental history of anxiety besides the inflammatory role of anxiety and stress so parental anxiety is known to any which ways have uh, underpinnings in any development right we have whenever you have the history of an anxiety disorder or depression in parents always the child will be vulnerable or at risk so intervening at the perinatal stage is very important you see fortunately our perinatal psychiatrists in india are at par with the global psychiatrists we have a fantastic team and they are really doing global related work because it's so important we always since years have been harping on physical health nutrition this that so on and so forth not realizing that before this the mother was also kept in an environment which was relatively stress free 
Now, I'm not trying to advocate that mothers shouldn't work or they should not do what they're doing. We should do everything. All of us have our working moms. But at the same time, one has to be very cognizant of the fact that if you have anxiety, you need to address it. Because fetal outcomes may not be autism. It may be something else, but it needs to be addressed. Yeah, so uh, Maithili has asked, folate receptor autoantibody testing done in India. So Maithili, I, I think there was um, one center who was supposed to start it, but as of now, I do not think that it is done. There was some place where they had started it, but I don't think it worked out or there was some issue with the whole folate receptor autoantibody. So as far as I know, it's not done. If anyone else has anything to contribute more from a genetic perspective, even I would be happy to hear that. How early can we diagnose ASD by Dr. Gautam Saha? As early as two to six months, they're saying now with visual tracking. Visual tracking is becoming almost a singular evidenced indicator of early autism. So we are going into, uh, you know, visually evoked potentials and visual tracking, not only clinically, but also brain images. But again, the same thing is that you put that little two month old baby into an, a scanning image and then are you doing service or disservice is where the question comes. And then if you want to take it, it is regarding management. Does OT uh, have a role to play? A huge role. OT has a huge role to play in autism. And see, we, we there are lots and lots of different types of therapies which have been evidenced. We don't really have a strong evidence base for them. We are a resource crunched country. And in that country, when we provide sensory integration, at least you're providing something. So I would definitely say we have an autist in our team. We have an autist in the therapeutic team. And occupational therapy is something that benefits every child. And more so those who have autism, ADHD, and along that spectrum. Clinically, do you want me to take the questions? Ali Muladi. Yeah. Ashwam, they are asking about, uh, Devadeep has asked about ADHD symptoms being there. So, how to and uh, when should we start methylphenidate and atomoxetine? Good question. I didn't touch upon management because of paucity of time, and I wanted to pre present this neurodevelopmental bit to you all. See, uh, Devadeep, there are, there's a whole, um, because of the spectrum, there are some of those who don't really respond well to methylphenidate as well as atomoxetine, particularly if they veer more towards the ASD spectrum is what we have seen clinically, right? In fact, they respond better to the antipsychotic combinations, particularly aripiprazole. However, if we are seeing more of the hyperactivity and that being the autism being a little bit more in the background and more of the syndromic thing, then they definitely respond to methylphenidate and atomoxetine. We try and stick to six years to start with it, but there have been some children who have been extremely difficult to manage where you can start with methylphenidate as early as four or five years. There is some evidence which is summing up now to start with stimulants in preschoolers. We don't have very uh, high numbers but it is starting. I would still say with a pinch of salt, uh, with a word of caution, as far as starting that is concerned, don't make it your first line. Try other things first. We don't have FDA approval yet. There is a question. There's uh -huh. a question on QEEG. What about the uh, possibility of hidden absence seizures for uh, symptoms like uh, disruptivity and cognitive issues? So, um, absent seizures is actually more picked up clinically than other seizures, right? The thing that we don't pick up very often is the sleep seizures. ESIS is a syndrome which is often missed yes. in children and more so in those with autism. So, as a baseline, if you're asking me, we would want to do QEEG. Um, if you're getting a child where you feel that the intervention is not working very well in terms of your therapies, if you get a child where you feel that the clinical trajectory is a little off and you're pretty sure that this is not someone who has core autism, I would say yes. Go ahead and do that EEG and see. Now, why am I saying wait for that? 
because very often you would find children who have autism to have abnormal EEGs. Now you don't want to treat the EEG, so tread yes. with caution. Yes, uh, that's put very wonderfully because sometimes uh, we get carried away by a lot of reports which the parents bring to us, including EEG reports and MRI reports and uh, OTPT reports. So uh, when we try, want to reassure the patient, uh, parents and we are also looking for pharmac and non-pharmac options, uh, I think the best uh, thing is to wait for pharmac interventions and start with non-pharmac. And uh, usually we try to involve mother as a co-therapist. Uh, because a lot of our uh, parent, uh, patients and their parents come from far off from Delhi. So it's important that the mother gets trained and some mothers come for summer vacations in Delhi and just to get trained. Uh, and then the next vacation, they'll again come for booster training. So it's very important to involve the whole family. And uh, that leads us to a question by Survi Vishnoi, who you well, are yeah, MD just Before Meena, just one sec, before you go on to the next question, I also want to add to what you said very rightly, that very often we need to give pharmacotherapy for the non-pharmacotherapy to act. Yes. See, as if the yes. child is not receptive, you're trying yes. occupational therapy, you're trying speech therapy, you're trying everything, but the child is not receptive because obviously the brain still has so much yes. which is going on. Yes. And when you give that ph pharmacotherapy yes. for a period of time, it may be as yes. short as six months. And we've given it to our children whenever they've had that immune up and down. You know, we can yes. make up, you know, this child is coming back with these symptoms. We give it for a period of six months, one year. Child settles down. Therapies start penetrating, improving. Yes. You can so this is one condition where it is very fascinating how you can actually yes. use the pharmacotherapy up and down to really help you improve the trajectory, which is a long drawn affair, you know. Yes, yes, very true. Uh, then Dr. Suri Vishroy, who used to be our resident, uh, she has asked, uh, how do we prognosticate and inform worried parents? The moment we have a diagnosis of ASD, how to communicate? Because finally we want to involve the parents in the therapeutic process also. It's a long run affair. So how best to do it? Surpi, it's not easy to break this diagnosis to any parent. Fortunately, today the parents most of the time come to you with the diagnosis. They've already read, they've already found out, therefore they've come to you because they know that Dr. Surbi is very good with ASD, so I must go to Dr. Surbi, right? So you have that advantage vis-a-vis -vis maybe 20 years ago when that was not the case number one. Number two, I always tell parents that, you know, the path is not easy. And I don't understand why you have been chosen to be the parent of a child with special needs, but there must be some reason. Possibly because you're someone who can handle it and who can take care of it. But if you don't take care of yourself, you're not going to be able to take care of your child. Number two, if you lose hope or if you think it's the end of the world, your child is definitely going to pick that up because that umbilical cord gets cut at birth, but it remains throughout life. So you are going to be the lifeline for your child forever. So the choice first is for you to think, this is not going away. This is not going to disappear. It's not going to change overnight. I don't have a magic pill to make it, you know, turn around 360 degrees. What I do have is to offer you therapy, to offer you help if you need help or you're feeling burnt out and to hold your hand along the way in a path which may be difficult, which may be straddled with tears at times, but I can promise you that I will be there with you throughout that path whenever you're needed. Maybe not physically, but whenever we need to, we can meet. And of course, with so many of my other colleagues who will help you. So we need to try and see that your child, forget the label, finds the best road for himself or herself. Your choice is whether we do it together or whether we don't do it at all. So you empower the parent, assuring them that you are with them throughout the way. And I think that makes the difference. Okay, I think, uh, Mina ma'am, we have covered all the questions in the chat box. There is one question by Dr. Ejaz on diet, role of diet in increased pain threshold. Sure. So, 
it has diet is something which we have very little evidence for in terms of scientific evidence there is work going on but we have done in fact we have also done a study which is uh, to be published soon on meal time behaviors and durations which is linked to the diet pain threshold i would not specify that that is the reason where we would be working on but i would say pain as a symptom plethora in a whole huge list of symptoms which may be recurrent in the child again there are people who have tried the gluten free diets the casein free diets you know so on and so forth, and they work for some children it's not that they don't work for some there are some who actually have benefited with elimination diets but can we generalize it not really that's the problem the whole problem is that we have so much of specificity and personalization that we need to evolve and work towards that and then when we work towards that whether diet and whether the pain threshold itself being the personal construct is it going to work out today i don't have an answer to give that right so but we do advise parents that do do try trial and error as far as this is concerned if you have a child who has obviously gut issues but don't keep that the only form of therapy what happens is that when parents go into that then they stop everything else and then that is where the disaster happens yeah ma'am there is a question by sumbul where do poor people go come to government hospitals We so what are the government centers available any no most of the most of the major hospitals in the cities which are government aided and run most of them do testing they have an occupational therapist they have speech therapists they have centers meena has one we have one so you definitely can go because it's a mci and mc requirement to have all this on board there's a little waiting time but they can go there it's not that they can't sure ma'am i think we have covered all the questions ma'am uh, just a small question for me uh, you talked about precision autism and how it is going to evolve so what is the actually what is actually the future of this spectrum uh, as a diagnosis and as a treatment any any clues on that so um i think that changing from the types of autism to the spectrum has been good for the children because the spectrum has helped more people actually take advantage and get into the rung you see you see the numbers suddenly we are seeing this whole huge thing as far as precision autism is concerned i think if we move towards an era i'm not sure if i also will be around when that happens but i'm hoping it will happen where we can actually uh, diagnose antenatally number 1 and number 2 if not antenatally at least early very early within the first 2 years say that this is what is actual autism and not all those spectrums therefore we can intervene early and i am repeating myself but i am going to say it again that that visual tracking i love it because i i can do it clinically i don't have to depend on someone who's going to be checking the you know the usg or someone who's going to check the visual ego potential if i can hone myself to understand and screen that visual tracking and get better and better at it clinically and if i start intervening at an early age which probably we are not going to be the ones alone to intervene there will be neonatologists and maybe occupational therapists or other sensory therapists who are going to intervene at that point if we can actually do it then i think the trajectory will change alin how to do that clinically i hope we are not being diagnosed right now by you no <laughs> no uh, so this is this is like saying that increased screen time caused autism in the pandemic no 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 we are talking about children who as early as 2 months of age are going to have difficulty in tracking i the visual tracking like we showed in that you know the two sets of images so you actually train them to do eye tracking and how we are going to do that is going to be the challenge for us for early intervention amina ma'am 
Yes, it has been a fascinating discussion. Uh, I would just like to say that uh, if you want to have more autism related research in India, we have to start by educating our ethics committee members and our grant agencies. India has a huge pool of uh, trained manpower. We can actually do research at par with the world, but sometimes we get inhibited by lack of funds and a lack of understanding of the ethics committee who feel that we are unnecessarily disturbing a child. Uh, you know, they become very protective whenever minors are involved. So, uh, but this is such an important area of research. Uh, maybe in the next two years, if uh, somebody uh, does some workshop, I, I'll be very happy to contribute that we start educating other people who take decisions which either facilitate our research or impede our research. So uh, that would be one way to take the work of people like Alka and others forward. If you can contribute, I'm not an autism researcher, but definitely we should try to uh, orient ethics committees and grant, grant agencies. I would like to say that. And uh, regarding government systems, uh, autism related care is available in Armel Hospital in Delhi, in EBAS in Delhi, AIMS in Delhi. Uh, Delhi is very blessed to have a lot of centers, but I'm sure in other cities like Lucknow and Kanpur, Ilabad and Banaras also, there'll be uh, government centers also which provide good quality care. Thank you so much. I think Dr. Gautam Sai is there. Is there any comments from you? Oh, yes. Uh, it is a really excellent presentation by Alka, as usual, one of the best teachers of, in Indian Psychiatric Society. And definitely, there are lots of things. In fact, honestly, I listened some of his some of our lecture today, not completely, but it was fantastic and learned a lot. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you so much, Alka, ma'am. Uh, it was really uh, nice being here. Over to organizers. Uh, thank you, Chairs, Dr. Meena and Dr. Aleem. Uh, at the outset, it is uh, an honor to represent Indian Association of Biological Psychiatry. And on behalf of our president, Dr. UC Garg, our vice presidents, Dr. Sunil Mittal and Dr. Pram Pramod Kumar, and the entire EC and um, FMB board. Uh, it is, uh, we are very grateful to everybody who are participating today, uh, our faculty, the special Dr. Alka Subramaniam, who now we know that uh, there was no better choice for this topic. Uh, and uh, she has dragged in and attracted so many stalwarts to listen to uh, the, the session today. Like we have Dr. Uh, Keshav Rao, we have Dr. Saha joining us, we have Dr. Indira Sharma joining us. Though Dr. Indira Sharma ma'am has been, uh, you know, very interested in biological psychiatry and has been regularly attending our sessions. So we're very grateful to our participants. And the chairs uh, did an excellent job. Uh, as usual, we can completely rely on uh, the editor of IAVP, Dr. Aleem, to do a good moderation. And Dr. Meena Chanda has been most uh, supportive and uh, enthusiastic about it. Thank you so much. Um, our MediSquare team, uh, today we have Akanksha doing all the uh, uh, logistics. Thank you so much. Our sponsor for today, uh, Alchem Laboratories, has uh, been very supportive and kind in helping us put together this curated series. Um, uh, it, uh, just before we go, a uh, small reminder that IABP does have an, a YouTube channel, and if you subscribe to it, you're going to get all of these free access material there. Uh, of course, uh, we will also share the links with you, but go ahead. Like I said, this is a free access uh, theory series, and if you all are interested in any particular topic, to write to us, we will definitely look see to it that we can incorporate those topics as well. Um, so on behalf of IBP, I once again thank you everyone uh, for joining us today and where one and a half hours went, I don't think any of us realized and that's the power of Alka. Thank you so much. Good night, stay safe, stay thank healthy. You. Thank you so much, Rukshida. Thank you for having me here. And I, I hope that I have set some people thinking. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Meena. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank it was you. wonderful.
thank you good night good night ma'am thank you thanks bye